following is a production of the Media Ministry at New Salem Baptist Church in Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, in the Metro Chattanooga area. We invite you to be our guest at any of our weekly worship services or visit us online at NewSalemBaptist.net. worship today at New Salem. It is so, ga- so good to see all of you, and it's so good to have those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we are looking forward to a great time of worship here together. Saw a few folks who are back for the first time today. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Uh, saw a few other old friends who've come in today. It's good to have you folks with us, and seen some new faces as well. And if this is your first time here, we get it. You walk into a new place, and you just kind of want to fade into the background and, and, and kind of fly under the radar. We understand that, but we would like the chance to maybe get to know you a little bit. And the way we do that, if you're ready to take that step, you'll notice on the back of the pew in front of you, there are some white and blue cards that say, Let, let's make a connection. If you wouldn't mind taking one of those cards and you can fill it out uh, the way you prefer to be contacted. And there's even places on there you can check if you want specific information. And then at the end of the service, as you exit this room, you'll notice there's a white box by either of the exits. Just drop it in that 
white box, and we'll be in touch real soon. If you're joining us online and it's the first time you've been with us, uh, you can do the same thing on our website at newsalembaptist.net. Just scroll down the homepage a little bit. There's a form there you can fill out, hit submit, and then we'll be in touch real soon. But we are, uh, we are here to celebrate. God is at work in our church and in our community, and we've come together to, uh, to take joy in that. And we are uh, here to, uh, uh, to celebrate him and what he's doing in our midst. At the end of the service, there's going to be a chance to respond. If God is speaking to you specifically about some step, step of faith you need to take, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that at the end of the service. We also uh, are going to have announcements about some things that are coming up real soon at the end of the service, too. So don't rush out right at the end. Make sure you stick around to find out uh, so you, you won't miss anything that maybe you want to plug into. Uh, let's make the Lord feel welcome here among his people right now. I'm going to ask our chairman of deacons, Brother Mike Mayfield, to come. He's got some needs that people have asked us to pray about, and he's going to lead us all in prayer. And I invite you, if you feel led and you're comfortable doing so, uh, feel free to join us up here at the altar as we invite the Lord into this service today. Brother Mike. Good morning. Now, God has called us to be disciples and that entails a lot of things, and prayer is one thing that we can always do for people. Plus, we can reach out to them. The only way they're ever going to know Jesus, you think about the person that introduced you to him. Somebody needs you to introduce him to them. So as always, let's remember our lost, <clears throat> remember our nation, pray for healing from these viruses that we have up there, out there and continue to pray for our people who are sick and shut in, people who have lost loved ones, <clears throat> Delta White, Herschel Price, Richard Harvey, Kate Upton and Don Upton, Charlie Rogers, Margaret Spangler. I had to take Margaret to the hospital earlier this morning pray for her especially, Jerry Holloway, Judy McDaniel, Bobby Klein, Chris Varnell, Pete and Connie Nix, Jack and Joyce Johnson, <clears throat> Freddie and Judy Weiss, William Loftus, James and Tina Newman, Ken and Lois Johnson, Tom and Sandy Hughes, Wayne and Polly Hatmaker, Tommy Smith, Martha Hudson, Dot Evans, Elizabeth Mayfield, Sandra Jordan, Doc Uran, uh, Joe Vandegrift, June Allison, Judy Jordan, Barbara Ferryweather, Faye Porter, Tracy Hickman, Sue Carpenter, Nancy Uran, Shirley Cox, Kobe Sutherland, Eddie Landreth, Wendon Nichols, Terry Buckner, Brenda Robertson, Charlie Campbell. Pray for our church outreach. Pray for our upcoming vacation Bible school. Uh, our fire police, first responders and teachers, our servicemen and women, healthcare workers, our president and leaders. Pray for our pastor, our worship team, and all, as a part of our service today. Pray for our children and youth ministries and their leaders. And if we have any unspoken, <clears throat> okay, I'll cross the house. Let's pray. Fathers, we come to you today, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, for each blessing of life. We want to thank you for salvation and for Jesus and for uh, him coming into our lives and saving us. We want to Thank you for the person that introduced us. We want to thank you, Lord, for the people that we come in contact with, that we can minister to, that we can um, present our body as a living sacrifice, an example of what your love and your peace and your joy can do. And we pray that you'll go with us and guide us each step of the way. We know, Lord, that there's many hurting. We know there's many that's not on this list, many that were unspoken. And we just pray that you will reach out to these people, 
convict us as your disciples, Lord, to minister to them. Help us to do your will. We pray a strong prayer for our nation, Lord. We know you're in control, and sometimes we don't understand some of the things that are happening. But we know, Lord, that, uh, that you're in control and that you can give us the individual peace and the love and joy that, that we need. Uh, pray for our pastor as he speaks to us today, for our praise team, our musicians, all that has a part of the service. We pray, Lord, that each thing that we do will be to glorify and uplift the name of Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen.
Good morning. Is anybody awake this morning? Everybody stand up with us. We'll sing Raise the Hallelujah.
we start. This next song we've not done with y'all before. Sing it all the time in the car. Sing it with my kids. It's been a struggle this week with this song. The song is called Scars. And every one of us in here has them. Some of them are fresh and we can't quite look at where we're going with them or where God's going with them. And some of them we've had a long, long time and we can look back and go, oh, I see now. The scars that we have on our life, they make us who we are. Hopefully they make us wiser. Hopefully they turn us to the one that can heal us. And ultimately the scars that we should be most thankful for are the ones that are on our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And one day the only scars there will ever be are His. So I encourage you, if you don't know this song, just listen to the words and take it in.
Thank you. you. May be seated. Why don't you just give up? How many times have you felt like that recently? I, uh, it seems like everywhere I go lately, I, I run into people uh, who are just kind of existing in churches and businesses and hospitals and schools. And people just kind of, they're so discouraged, they're just kind of shuffling along with this like, oh man, what else can happen kind of uh, atmosphere around them. And this was before the so-called third wave of this pandemic began to rear its ugly head this last week. Uh, If you get knocked down, kicked down, and held down long enough, there comes a point where giving up starts to maybe look like a, a reasonable option. As we have been studying the residents of Jerusalem in the 6th century BC, we're on the verge of giving up. They were refugees. They'd returned to the city after nearly 70 years of exile in a foreign land. And uh, many of them, this was the first time they'd ever set foot in the land of their ancestors. They, all they had about Jerusalem were stories from their parents or their grandparents. And so they came into this city with a lot of excitement. They came with a sense of calling that God was bringing them home to rebuild the temple and to restore the city and there were some initial victories however pretty soon they ran into a series of obstacles that threatened to challenge their faith and quench their enthusiasm their neighbors out of envy out of spite who knows but their their neighbors began to harass and intimidate them to try to stop the construction Those efforts at obstruction, as we looked at last time, included filing grievances in the courts and actually bribing the officials to uh, gum up the works. Obstacles became delays, nearly 16 years of delays, which bred frustration, fear, and finally apathy. The people of God were on the verge of giving up. The enemies of God could look at the foundations of that barely started project. They could pat themselves on the back and they could have a good laugh at God's expense. God's glory was being diminished because the temple still lay in ruins. But something happened around August of 520 B.C. that lit a fire under these returning refugees. And in just a few short weeks, they went from dead stop to full speed ahead and restarted that construction project. And within five years, they had finished that new temple. It was really an amazing thing. Now, we haven't been waiting for 16 long years, but we have been sitting nearly idle for 16 months. 
a lot of people are frustrated. They uh, look, they're frustrated by the disruption of the pandemic itself and all the headaches that's brought on us. They're frustrated by the slow pace at which everything seems to be getting back to some sense of normal. Uh, other people are fearful that things may never get back to something we recognize. What if this is the way it's going to be from now on? What if we just have to learn to live with it? So there's fear along with that frustration. Maybe we need a shot of whatever they got in August of 520 BC. Maybe that's what we need. What can we learn from their situation and how they met those obstacles that can help us in our situation today? That's what we're going to look at in Ezra chapters 5 and chapter 6. If you'd like to turn there in your Bibles. Now, before we dive into this, I need to ask for your grace a little bit today. It has been kind of a crazy week in my life. Um, it seems like as we go through this rebuilding process, there's a thousand and one decisions and actions that need to take place, and most of them needed to happen yesterday. So uh, this week I made a concerted effort to knock out some things off my to-do list that will enable other people to do their work. And the downside of that is it really cut into some of my preparation time. For example, normally I give the people in the booth what amounts to a full manuscript of my notes so they know what the slide to show when. Today, they pretty much got bullet points, okay? And uh, the, the problem with that is it, the manuscript's not to tell me what to say. It's to tell me what to leave out. So I feel for you folks today. Uh, if I say something that really, really moves your spirit, then give God the glory. If I say something that sounds really stupid, that's on me, okay? But I just ask for a little grace today as we do this. But I want us to look at, there's 10 things basically, and a couple of these I want to really sink into, but most of them we're only going to be able to kind of hit in a surface kind of way. But, but 10 things, as, as the people of God were rebuilding the house of God, they overcame obstacles, first of all, and this is the most important one, they overcame obstacles by obeying the word of God. In Ezra chapter 5, starting at verse 1, when the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God which is in Jerusalem and the prophets of God were with them supporting them. This is the spark that started the revival. God sent his people two prophets whose preaching stirred them out of their slumber. We're told by name Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo. We have works by both of these men. We have re records of their sermons in our Old Testament. These men came to speak the word of God in the name of God to the people of God. Haggai seemingly came out of nowhere. We really don't know much about him at all. He just kind of shows up in August of 520 BC. He preaches three sermons and lights a fire. Man, every preacher in America would love to have that kind of impact. Just to get up and all he had was three sermons, but it made all the difference in the world. And he shows up, for example, in Haggai 1, verse 2. And he says, thus says the Lord of hosts. And he uses there, uh, in Hebrew, that is, the Lord, is, it translates God's personal name. The, main, the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. I am who I am. The Lord of hosts pictures God standing at the forefront of all of heaven's armies. Think of all the angels of heaven behind God, ready to move out at his command. That is an image of power and authority. And when the Lord of hosts speaks, you better listen, right? So Haggai says, thus says the Lord of hosts. This people says, the time has not yet come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. So in the midst of this 16 years of delays and frustration, they had basically given up and said, you know what? It's just not the right time. Things aren't coming together. We don't have the resources. We don't have the time. There's too many obstacles. But they did have plenty of time to do other stuff, like build their own houses. And, and Haggai hits them up on that. Through Haggai, the Lord called on his people to stop making excuses and to start making the effort to rebuild the temple. In Haggai 1, verses 7 to 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, and behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? Declares the Lord of hosts. Because 
of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. So God is saying, I've blessed you with all of this abundance, everything you need to carry out the mission I've given you, and you've wasted it. So you know what? I'm taking it back. They were going through a drought. They were going through a famine. It seemed like you know, their, their, their wallets had holes in them. You ever been through that where it seemed like you know, the money goes straight through your pocket? And God says, you don't know what that is? You've taken my blessings and you've wasted them. So I'm taking them back because your priorities are out of whack. And he called on them to get busy doing what he had brought them back to Jerusalem to do, which was to reestablish worship at the temple. Uh, Zechariah, if Haggai brought the stick, Zechariah held out the carrot of hope. Okay? In Zechariah chapter 1, Zechariah describes this vision he has of an angel talking to the Lord. And uh, the angel pleads for the Lord to intervene on behalf of Jerusalem. In Zechariah 1.12, thus the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, which you have been indignant, the, with which you've been indignant these 70 years? And the Lord responded, uh, the Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words, comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, and I, but I'm very angry with the nations who are at ease. For while I was only a little angry, they furthered the disaster. What he means there is, of course, if you know the story, the people of Judah and Jerusalem had been rebelling against God. God had sent them multiple prophets to warn them to get them back on track. They hadn't listened. God says, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to let a foreign invader come in and carry you off, destroy the city. Guess what happened? They didn't, so he did. And the Babylonians came in, they leveled the city, they tore down the temple. That's what got them in this predicament in the first place. But God says, you know, I was trying to do that to get their attention. I, you know, I had, God was angry with them because of their rebellion. But he says, but the nations I used took it further than I intended. So now he is turning back and having mercy on his people. Okay? Uh, I was only a little angry. They, they the Babylonians, furthered the disaster Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and a measuring line will be stretched over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. So Haggai brings the tough message, Zechariah brings the message of hope, and between the two of them, they stirred the people. The people of God heard the word of God, and they responded. And we see in verse 2 that under the political leadership, represented by Zerubbabel, and the spiritual leadership, represented by Jeshua, they renewed their efforts to rebuild the temple. And the leaders and the people continued to listen to God's word during this rebuilding process. That's what he means here uh, when he says the prophets of God were with them, supporting them, okay? And a lot of scholars believe that them there refers to not just Zerubbabel and, and uh, Jeshua, but the entire group of people who were taking part in this rebuilding process, all the residents of Jerusalem. As, they, as long as they listened to the word of God, God was with them. Now, if God had such an empowering word of encouragement concerning a temple which was destined always only to be temporary, how much more? Will they have a word for an assembly that is destined to be eternal? As Jesus told his disciples, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he's talked there in Matthew 16, he's talking about the rock of faith, of the recognition that he is the Savior God has sent into the world. And when we uh, respond to that invitation that Jesus offers us to repent and believe, then we are connected with him and we are part of the called out ones, the ecclesia, uh, the word that's translated church in our New Testament the assembly of those who have been called out through faith in Jesus. And he says, this church, these called out ones, says the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Nothing will defeat the church. Now, there may be particular churches, local expressions of that church that, that struggle and suffer. I know uh, one of the most um, uh, profound experiences I ever had was standing on a beach uh, near the city of Akko, 
in, in Israel on the, uh, a mosaic floor, uh, about half the, not even half the size of this room, about the size of our lobby of a church that had been built in like the third century BC and it had been covered after it was destroyed, it was covered up by the sands and nobody knew it was there until they were doing a, a, a putting a, a drainage pipe or something and the, the workers found it there. A church that had been lost for 1,700 years. So there may be individual churches that disappear, but the church, the church universal, not even the gates of Hades can overcome it. And as the Apostle Paul would remind the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17, do you not know? You, and he's, in Greek it's you all. He's talking to the whole church here. You are a temple of God. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So here's this church in Corinth that is fighting and having division and struggling and calling each other names and, and having all this bickering going on. And Paul says, hey guys, time out. You all are the temple of God. God doesn't dwell in a building anymore. God dwells in his people. His presence is through his people. In this world anyway, it's through his people. And you're the temple. And he goes on to say, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. The temple is set apart for God's use. And woe be any person who tries to sunder that temple. That's how much God cares about his church, of which this body is a part. God hasn't given up on his church. Peter says in 1 Peter uh, 2, verses 4 and 5, And coming to him, coming to Christ, as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Now, in the Old Testament, where did the priests stay and what, where were the sacrifices offered? In the temple. So we are being built up as God's temple on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So everything, everything, everything we do as a church must be built upon the foundation of the Word of God, especially as that Word is embodied in the Son of God, Jesus, the Word made flesh. God still has a word for his church. He hasn't given up on his church yet. And we are here for a reason. These lights are still on for a reason. God has not snuffed out our candlestick yet. As your presence here today demonstrates, God's still got something going on at 9806 Dallas Hollow Road. And we need to hear the word of God and respond to it and be obedient to it. Something else, and this is a little important here, especially in light of our context. Not only did they obey the word of God, but they acted in good faith as good citizens. In verse 3, at that time, after the construction resumed, Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shethar Bozani and their colleagues came to them and spoke to them saying, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish this structure? So no sooner had the people of God resumed work on the house of God, that the opposition also resumed its efforts to raise roadblocks in their path. The regional governor, uh, Tatanai is described as the governor of the province beyond the river. That means everything west of the Euphrates. This guy is way on up the pecking order. The Persian, it's the Persian Empire at this point, uh, the Persian Empire was divided up into this bureaucracy. And everybody kind of, there was levels, and everybody reported up the chain. Well, this guy's basically governor over half the empire. The half that includes Jerusalem and Israel. And so this guy's pretty big deal. So the word gets up to him and he starts an inquiry. No doubt this inquiry was prompted by the complaints of Jerusalem's neighbors. As we read about in chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. How they, uh, uh, the people of the, of the land discouraged the people, frightened them from building, hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia. So this is probably part of that whole legal uh, harassment campaign that's going on. But 
Here's the thing. You can't fault Tat and I, okay? Because though his inquiry may have been grounded by, or, or based on false accusations, he had legitimate grounds for investigating. Um, remember, this is nearly 16 years has passed since Cyrus had commissioned the Jews to return from Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild. In the meantime, Cyrus had died, and there was a new king on the throne, Darius I. Actually, there was another guy in there in between, but he didn't last long, Cambyses. But uh, Darius comes on the throne. He's not a direct descendant of, of Cyrus, but there's a little bit of a, a civil war that goes on, and he comes out on top. And scholars tell us the first two years of his reign were particularly turbulent as he's having to squash all these rebellions and uh, establish his control, secure his control over the Persian Empire. So there's that going on, and the types of large stones that were being used in this rebuilding project that we read about down in chapter 5, verse 8, those very same stones could easily be used to not only build the temple, but to refortify the city to get ready for invasion, okay? So Tad and I is simply looking out for the interest of the empire. Sometimes the state does have a legitimate interest. And he sends this inquiry, whether he comes himself or he sends a delegation, he sends an inquiry to the leadership in Jerusalem. and says, what in the world are you guys doing? Who gave you permission to do this? And look at how they respond in verse 4. Then we told them accordingly what the names of the men were who were reconstructing the building. So God's people responded to this inquiry not with a combative spirit, but with a cooperative spirit. There's a time and a place for civil disobedience, but it should never be our first response. Okay? Consider the uh, differing approaches that some churches took during the pandemic. All right? uh, we were very blessed here in our state to have a governor who really gets religious liberty. And there were a few weeks there where everybody was shut down. I mean, you know, unless you were, had a pass, you weren't supposed to be out on the roads uh, back in April of 2020. But other than that, you know, nobody has tried to stop us from doing anything. Um, and, uh, every step of the way, the, the governor was like, you know, we cannot tell you not to meet to worship. But if you do choose to meet, please follow these precautions. And so we tried to act in good faith. And, and follow some of those precautions. And I think they helped us ride this thing out pretty well. We did not have very many cases in our church at all compared to some. But uh, the, the governor was really involved in, they, they saw the churches as partners. Uh, he, he held several Zoom calls with pastors. I took part in a couple of those where they solicited our opinion. They gave us information, told us what was going on. And just, you know, there was, a, there was clear lines of communication there. Unfortunately, this was not the case everywhere in the United States. And there were some states where the governments took a very hard line. In some states against everybody, but in some states against churches in particular. And folks, we're going to see more and more of this happen. As, our, as the United States as a whole becomes more and more secular, and fewer and fewer people have any comprehension of biblical religion or of religious liberty, we're going to run into stuff like that more and more because people just don't get it. Okay? They think we're from Mars or something. Okay? And so some church, church had different responses. Now you, have, you hear about some churches that made the news in big ways who just instantly went to right to civil disobedience. We're going to meet. They can't tell us we can't meet. We're going to do whatever we can. And you had lawsuits filed. You had deputies showing up. You had chains being put on doors. And you know all kinds of hard-nosed tactics on both sides going on. Then you had some other churches. And this is uh, just a few weeks ago. There's a church up in Washington, D.C., Capitol, uh, Capitol, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it. Mark Devers, the pastor there. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him. He's written a lot of books. But uh, Cap uh, this church, church is nearly 200 years old. They have, as a matter of their polity, I think it's actually in their bylaws, they did not live stream at all during this whole last 16 months. Because in their thinking, they believe the church needs to be gathered together. They take that passage from Hebrews, you know, about not forsaking our assembly very seriously. They don't believe a lot of that ministry can be done remotely. So, you know, they, uh, even before, they weren't live streaming. They don't live stream now. And they believe they really need to be together. But in Washington, D.C., that was a problem because the government said you can't do that. 
But here's what happened. Uh, the, governor, the government in D.C. began allowing other groups to meet outside. They said, well, all we want to do, the church said, all we want to do is we want to meet outside in this park near the church. Okay? Uh, we'll follow whatever precautions. We'll stay six feet apart. We'll do whatever you want us to do, but we want to meet in person outside. And the city of D.C. said no. So they took them, they took the city to court. And about two weeks ago, they won a quarter million judgment against Washington, D.C. Because the court said, you're right. In their lawsuit, they pointed out the, the mayor of New York of, of Washington was allowing all these political rallies to go on. She even attended some of them, but they wouldn't let us meet, even with precautions. And the court said, you're right, that's not fair. And so they granted them this huge judgment to cover their legal fees and for their trouble. Now, it took a long time. It took them 14 months to work through that process. But tell me this, in that community, which scenario do you think resulted in more people giving glory to God and being open to the gospel? Is it the people that immediately went to it's us versus them? Or is it the people that said, hey, we're going to meet you halfway, but we're going to stand up for our rights too? I dare say there's probably more people saying, okay, especially if they got the courts backing now, Probably more people willing to listen to what that church in D.C. has to say than some of the churches that took a harder line. Now, there is a time where you got to draw that line and say, uh-uh, this far and no further. But as we're called in Romans 13, we're called to be good citizens, to respect the authority of the state, as long as the state doesn't encroach on the authority of God. And so we need to, be, as much as possible, be good citizens. And that's what they were doing here in Jerusalem. They said, okay, do your inquiry. But here's the thing. Because of their... Good faith, Tad and I let the construction continue while the inquiry was going on. Now, if you think if they had gotten combative, do you think he would have allowed that? No, he probably would have sent in troops to shut the whole thing down. So there's a, some, we have to be acting in good faith as good citizens as much as we're able. Um, they also clarify, and this is important too, they clarify their identity as God's people. And then after this, I'm going to have to really pick it up. Because I know some of you got lunch plans. I'm, I'm going to declare a day of fasting, but no. <laughs> so, in verse 6, this is the copy of the letter which Tatna, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shether Belzani and his colleagues, the officials who were beyond the river, sent to Darius the king. They sent a report to him in which they, it was written To Darius the king, all peace. Let it be known to the king that we have gone to the province of Judah, to the house of the great God, which is being built with huge stones, and beams are being laid in the walls, and this work is going on with great care and is succeeding in their hands. Then we asked these elders and said to them, who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish this structure? Now here's, the, here's the, what I'm getting at, verse 10. We also asked them their names so as to inform you. They want to know who's involved in this. So that we might write down the names of the men who were at their head. Thus they answered us, verse 11, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth who are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago when a great king of Israel built and finished it. So they could have answered that inquiry in any number of ways. We're the descendants of Abraham, we're the Jews. We're the people, used to be the people of Israel. We used to have a nation here. No, they say we are the servants of the God of heaven. They had established clear in their minds what their primary identity was. They clarified their identity as God's people. They had their, they were getting, starting to get their priorities in order. And the reason I wanted to bring that out is because I think a lot of times today, and this is really hard for us in America Sometimes we don't have our identity clearly in order. Um, we've seen this a lot the last few years. I'm convinced you know, the way it should be is our politics are shaped by our relationship with God and our theology. But I think I've run into a lot of people the last couple of years whose theology is shaped more by their politics. And that's not the way, that's cart before the horse, folks. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are first and foremost members of Jesus' church. 
And we need to keep that in mind. Now, our citizenship as Americans is important, but it should be secondary to our citizenship in the kingdom of God. Because sometimes, believe it or not, those conflict. And when they conflict, the kingdom of God should take precedence. They clarified their identity, first and foremost, as God's people. Then, this is something else huge. They took responsibility for their failures. In verse 12, But when our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, and he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon, or excuse me, he, he, did, he did those things. They didn't sugarcoat it, they owned it. How often in church do we just try to sweep things under the rug and put a happy face on everything? Folks, God is glorified when we admit our weakness. When we mess up, we need to repent and we need to own it. I know so many churches today that over the years they have had situations going on in a church and instead of dealing with the ugliness of it, they've kept it in the back room or they swept it under the rug and hope nobody noticed. And a lot of times it comes back to bite them. They own their sin. Our forefathers messed up. They rebelled against the God of heaven. And as a result, we're sitting in rubble. But it was because they were willing to admit their sin and repent that God was able to do a mighty work in their midst. And I think it's a lesson that's often lost on us. They also worked through the proper processes. In verse 13, however, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. And the gold and the silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and brought them to the temple of Babylon, these King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, they were given to one whose name was Sheshbazar, whom he appointed governor. And they go on to talk about this whole process, this whole proclamation that Cyrus had issued. Now, apparently, they didn't have a copy of it. They could just hand over and say, here it is. So they had to appeal to the, the records for them to search through the records for it. There's something really key here. Uh, what the Babylonians did, whenever they destroyed somebody else's temple, they took the items of worship back to their temple and put them on display as a way of saying, our God is more powerful than that God. And it, so it is a huge thing for Cyrus to say, no, we're going to give these back. But the reality was, the God of the Babylonians was not more powerful than the God of the Hebrews. The God of the Hebrews allowed all this to happen for his own purpose and his own glory. And then when it was time to come back, he moved the process, he moved the hearts of Cyrus, he moved the hearts of the officials to allow these things to come back to home. But basically, they worked through the proper process and appealed to Tatani to search the records. In verse 17, now if it pleases the king, let a search be conducted in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon. If it be that a decree was issued by King Cyrus to rebuild the house of God at Jerusalem, then let the king send to us his decision concerning this matter. So they worked through the process. And then the people trusted in God for protection. In chapter 6, verse 1, then King Darius issued a decree. The search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. In Ecbatana, in the fortress, which is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found, and there was written in, as follows. And this is, uh, they started the search in Babylon. They didn't find anything in Babylon. Darius could have let it lie right there. But instead, he said, no, we're going to dig a little deeper. Ecbatana is a city up in the mountains in Persia, or Medea, what's modern-day Iran. It was Cyrus' summer palace. When it got hot in his... Uh, regular palace he would relocate his whole operation up to these mountains where they get a nice cool breeze for a few months and it was there not not in the capital of babylon not in the capital of the persian empire but in the summer capital that they finally found the records memorandum in the first year of king cyrus cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt, and let its foundations be retained. And then he, he gives some details about the rebuilding process, which pretty much followed the same pattern that Solomon had used to build it. They got the, the dimensions a little wrong. That could be a scribal error. But other than that, it's the same process that Solomon laid out when he built the original temple. But in verse 6, therefore, you know, he, after they, they, they found the, the record, 
Darius says, hey, they, they had permission from my predecessor. Now, verse 6, now, therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Sheth, Shethar Bozani, and your colleagues, the officials of the province beyond the river, keep away from there. Now, this is official Persian government speak for hands off. These folks are okay. This is a judgment in the favor of the people of Jerusalem, legally. The government has no business interfering with this project, is what he's saying here. Leave the work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild the house of God on its site. Now you say, now wait a minute. That's talking about King Darius. It doesn't mention God in there at all. Who put this in the king's heart? Do you think he came up with this on his own? This is how our God works. Proverbs tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of God. He stirs it like a river, whichever way he wants to. God was working behind the scenes to protect the mission of his people. And so the record is found and the ruling is issued to allow the work to continue. So they, they trusted in God's protection. And had they aggressively and rebelliously forged ahead, they would, have been, they would have guaranteed government intervention. But instead they trusted in God and God delivered. Then they also relied on God's provision. In verse 8, he goes on, Darius goes on, Therefore I issue a decree concerning what you're to do for those elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury. So not only did he allow it to happen, he helped pay for it. Wow, isn't God wonderful to put this on the heart of this pagan king? God provided. They, might, they had no clue. How are we going to build this huge building for God's glory? God knew. God provided. Just like the Egyptians had helped fund the Exodus. Just to get those people out of there. God worked through the heart of these pagan Persians to make the means available. I, in the early days of the pandemic, we found ourselves the beneficiaries of a little shortfall from the government. We didn't know what to do with it. We were scared to touch any of it. We were afraid the government would come with strings attached. So we parked it, and we've been letting it sit there. Maybe that's God's provision to allow us to do some of the things we need to do to move this church forward. But I have no doubt, even if that's not the case, I have no doubt that if we are obedient to the Word of God and we follow the mission God's given us, God will provide everything we need to accomplish the mission that he has given us to proclaim the gospel in this community. As long as we're following the word of God and standing on Christ. So they relied on God's provision. And then they persisted through to completion. In verse 13, Tatnai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Sheth Bozani and their colleagues carried out the decree with all diligence, just as King Darius had sent. And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying. Now, get this. All this, okay, all these things we looked at in the last few minutes. Here's what gets the credit. They were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah son of Edo. So they, they go back to the word of God that God had sent through his prophets. And they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So this continued until after Darius' reign, into the reign of Artaxerxes, the reconstruction of the city, not just of the temple, but of the walls of Jerusalem. But God brought it to completion. He who began a good work in you will see it through to completion. God is able to accomplish what he sets out to do when his people are obedient and follow him according to his word. Because that's how God is glorified. When we give up and leave it half done, people can drive by and laugh and say, well, guess that's not such a great God, is he? Those people couldn't even accomplish X. But when God gives us a task and a purpose and we see it through to the end, especially against the odds, God is glorified. And God receives the glory here. So what happened? What did they do? Well, first of all, they celebrated God's blessings. In verse 16, then the sons of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated the dedication of the house of God with joy. So they held a party. 
to dedicate it. Now, it wasn't as big as the party that Solomon had held when the original temple was built. But then again, they didn't have the resources Solomon had available to him at the time. And they didn't have as many people as Solomon had to govern either. They offered the for the dedication of the temple of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, corresponding to the number of the tribes of Israel. And this is really interesting here because at this point, remember, 10 of the tribes over 100 years, almost 200 years earlier, had been carried off into exile by the Assyrian Empire. These people who came from Babylon were primarily from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. They could have just held a dedication for the tri and, and offered for the sins of Judah and Benjamin, but they didn't. They had compassion on their brothers, and they, they said, we're all part of this. And so they, they had a, a sacrifice for the sins of each tribe. And it's also important they did that because they're recognizing it's only by God's grace we were able to do this. 18, then they appointed the priests of their divisions and the Levites in their orders for the service of God in Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. Again, they are following the word of God as they do this. But not only did they celebrate God's blessings, it doesn't end there. They consecrated themselves for God's purpose. The exiles observed the Passover on the 14th of the first month. What was the Passover? That was when they remembered how God had miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together, according to verse 20. All of them were pure. Then they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, both for their brothers and the priests and for themselves. The sons of Israel who returned from exile and all those who had separated themselves from the impurity of the nations of the land to join them to seek the Lord God of Israel ate the Passover. So the people... The leadership consecrates itself, sets itself apart for God's purpose. The people join in. They set themselves apart for God's purpose. They, they separated themselves from the sins of the other nations where they had been living. They, they cast aside ungodly customs. They came back to the word of God. And they observed the feasts of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had caused them to rejoice. And to turn the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So they set themselves apart for God's purpose. God has set us apart as well as a church. God has not given up on his church. The Great Commission remains in effect. Go make disciples. God is still seeking to draw people into his kingdom through Jesus. God is still inviting people like you and me to join him in that work. Now, the enemies of God are raising plenty of obstacles to keep that from happening. The question is, will we answer God's call or will we sit down and give up? Because the going got a little tough. Those who give up will never See the glory that will come when God completes his work. Those who hang on and persevere will get to celebrate with him. It's only those who keep their hands on the plow who get to enjoy the harvest. Church, God is calling. Are we ready to answer? There's much to be done here. It's time to wake up, get up, and get with it. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we acknowledge you as our Lord, that you are sovereign, you are on heaven's throne, nothing in this universe can thwart your purpose. And Lord, it is your purpose that the gospel of Jesus Christ be proclaimed in this community and around the world. And that you draw together people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to glorify your name, to repent and believe in Jesus, the one you've given to be our Savior. And Lord, we believe and confess that you drew a group of people to this corner of real estate 88 years ago to proclaim that message to this community. And by your grace, we are still here. Lord, we have been through a difficult year and a half. But Lord, you've been faithful. Lord, forgive us when we've gotten discouraged, when we have 
felt kicked down and pushed down, when the enemies have threatened at us and laughed at us, and we've been tempted to give up. But Lord, you are still on your throne. And Father, help us to stop making excuses and start making the effort to rebuild your house. May you be glorified in this church and in this community. And Lord, when all is said and done, may the spotlight be on you as we sit back and say, wow, look what God has done. We pray this in the name of the word made flesh, the word upon which we stand, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. I apologize for going a minute or two over. But I believe God had some things he wanted us as a church to hear through this passage today. It may be that God's been speaking to you too about a step of faith you need to take in your life. Maybe you've been discouraged, you've been kicked down, but God is rekindling your fire and your enthusiasm. Maybe today you should come to the altar and spend some time uh, returning from that apathy and asking God to restore your spirit, to restore your enthusiasm. Maybe God has put somebody on your heart person that you know who needs Jesus and you want to pray over that person, you want to add their name to our our wall of prayer over here. We just cleared out a bunch of new space. Maybe you're here and you've never opened your life up to Jesus. You've never embraced him as your savior. But today he's been speaking to you and drawing you to himself. And we want to give that opportunity today to come to Jesus to accept him into your life as your savior and your Lord. You don't even have to understand all the details of that. If you know that he's drawing you, we're going to ask you to step out in faith in just a moment and just come down and tell me, Pastor, I need to receive Christ. Can you tell me more? Maybe you've already received Christ as your Savior, but you haven't taken the step of proclaiming to the world that you've decided to follow Jesus. This is your opportunity to let us know you're ready to take that step by following him in baptism. Now, we won't take you back and baptize you today, but we'll get that machinery in motion. You just got to let us know you're ready to take that step. Maybe you're a believer, you've been baptized, and you need a church home to be part of, and you believe God's led you here. Maybe you like what you've heard about some of the things we're doing and you think God's working here and you want to be part of it. I'd love to share with you how you can officially become part of the New Salem family. However God's leading you today, come to him as he leads. Let's join together and say, and if God's drawing you, you come.
Thank you for being here today. I won't hold you much longer. I, th I thank you for your patience today. But a couple of announcements. First of all, we have. A, if you're looking for a ministry, uh, even if you're just entry level, where you can bless people and encourage them, we have got an opportunity for you. We are rebuilding our greeting core, and if you would uh, be interested in helping to greet people at the doors on Sunday mornings as they come in and help them to find places they need to be then there's a podium out here where you can sign up and we'll be in touch. We're going to try to do a little training, a little orientating as we get this very important ministry back on its feet. It's usually the first impression most people get of our church. So if you want to help out with that, then uh, please let us know by signing up and we'll be in, in touch. Um, next Saturday, Vacation Bible School, one day VBS extravaganza. Online registration is now open on our website. And we still have a couple of spots where we need people to plug in. And there's a sign-up sheet out here on the table where you can see what's still available and see where you may be able to help out. So please, if nothing else, be in prayer about Vacation Bible School this week. Uh, we have a, a great opportunity to, to really invest in the lives of some kids. I notice a lot of the kids that have already signed up online are not from our church. They're out from the community, so this gives us an opportunity to invest in them. So um, please consider signing up to help with that. We also... In August, coming up in August, I think it's August 14th, we have a back-to-school splash. We're going to have some uh, inflatable water slides, some water games and stuff for the kids, and uh, help us get the word out about that. And uh, we want to just get ready for school. That's the first Saturday after school starts back. And we just want to send these kids off in a fun way as they get ready to go back to school this year. So uh, that'll be coming up. We'll hear more details coming up soon. That's going to be on August, I think, the, I think the 14th, where that first Saturday is. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And I got a hand down here. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you for that. A couple, I almost forgot about it. a couple of things here. Um, Glenda Lloyd is going to be having surgery this week. Hopefully everything's going to go well. But we want to have prayer for you as well. And I'm going to ask, uh, well, let me do this other thing too. Where's uh, Adam and, and Beth here? Their daughter, Izzy, we don't do this enough for recognizing when kids in our church have some pretty cool things going on, but uh, Izzy's going to be competing in Junior Olympics coming up and, and twirling. And so uh, she is phenomenal. She won a big title this last, just a few weeks ago, right? She's Miss Major of Tennessee, advanced awesome. seven to nine. You, you can be proud of that. But, and, uh, but we, I don't, you know, sometimes we, we don't do enough to recognize the gifts and talents that God has put in our church. So we want to pray for them as they get ready for this. I talked to Izzy this morning, and I said, are you ready for next week? She goes, I am nervous. So we want to pray for her, for the nerves, pray for them as they, as they uh, are with her on that. We want to pray for Glenda. So I'm going to ask if I can some of our deacons, if you don't mind, to gather around these folks and maybe put a hand on our shoulder as we pray for them, and then we'll be dismissed. So, Of course, everybody's going to go to Glenda. But <laughs> I'll pray for you guys. <laughs> Izzy's back in the back, but we'll, uh, all right, let's pray. Father, you are so good, and you've blessed us so much. And Lord, we want to pray for these members of our church family that have some pretty important things coming up. We pray for the Reeds as they uh, travel with Izzy to take part in this competition. We pray that you'll uh, just push out her nervousness and fill it with a bold confidence and help her to represent not only her team, but also you. Father, may people see in her uh, the joy of the Lord as she competes. Father, we pray for, for uh, uh, Glenda as she goes through this surgery. I pray that your presence and your love will just push out any anxiety that she's feeling right now. And I pray that uh, you will surround her and protect her, guide her surgeon's hands, and bring her through this procedure and bless her with a quick recovery. We pray this in your name, trusting in your goodness. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.